Meg mentioned in CAPER, which is this kind of national effort bringing together lots of different people working in the arts field to do a variety of projects that are going to increase uh, preparedness. And Jan has been at the helm of Incaper for how long? A few years. She'll, she'll tell you about herself. Please welcome Jan Newcomb. Thank you. Hi. I'm glad to be here. Um, Drove in yesterday and staying at a little cottage uh, just down the road a piece. And um, I'm from Corning, New York, and I've returned there after many years of, of uh, running organizations kind of all over the place. Uh, and I'm a Johnny come lately to the preparedness side of things. I was hired by the Performing Arts Readiness Project in 2017 as their token, token performing arts executive who is, who's, uh, knows why uh, there is resistance by some small organizations, some large organizations, to be prepared. And I have really learned a lot, as Meg would attest. Uh, I did, came in with little knowledge of preparedness. However, I had a lot of experience throughout my 40 years, and that's kind of why I'm talking about this today. Uh, I ran, let's see, since I was 29, I ran, uh, have run eight performing arts organizations, local arts agencies. I've been a state grants um, director for the South Carolina Arts Commission. I've had my own dance company, um, done a lot of different things, and I've also taught. So. Um, what I'm going to say in, in answer to your question, if you get nothing else out of what I say today, please know that uh, there are a lot of resources that can answer your questions on preparedness, and, uh, including Surf Plus. Arts Ready is working with us on, we're preparing a, an online tool that you can use to put all your preparedness critical stuff in, in and uh, it will actually have an incident uh, management app for when we do have times of need, as, as we call the dark times. And uh, the Performing Arts Readiness has a lot of webinars that we've produced, and NCAPER has a lot of, um, of resources on it as well. So if nothing else, and I do have some uh, postcards out front. Okay, so I picked my top 10. Uh, actually, you'll see there are only eight categories, but a couple of them happened twice. Uh, so the cause and effect. First one, stalkers. Um, having realized when uh, I was really uh, approached by two stalkers, uh, limited egress for staff and for students. And I will go over each one of these, but I just wanted to outline it. And regional flooding uh, due to hurricanes, and one was just due to a recalcitrant deluge system in a theater. And it caused, the hurricane caused devastating loss of life and property. Loss of uh, major donors for a series, this happened to me twice, two different orchestras, one in the south and one in, in the north, and um, you know that you don't get a lot of warning on that, but you have to deal with it. Uh, roof collapse after, whoops, uh, excessive rain. And uh, right under the roof was our library with no mitigation for having a leaky roof and no reserve funds for correcting anything. Uh, this would be something you would be aware of here, eight inch surprise uh, on the day of performance. So we had, um, the cost would, be, would have been $50,000 to cancel the performance because we had had four rehearsals, which I was obligated to pay for. Car crashing into my office. That was a special one. <laughs> um, 
and causing just before, um, uh, two weeks before performance, no access to our office files where everything was, of course. And this actually happened to a friend of mine, but I decided it was an important thing, the bomb threat in during a performance and how she handled that when there was no, it was a brand new uh, performing arts center and there was no plan yet in place for evacuation. And then also very important, uh, clogged furnace, which almost cost us our lives. So, stalker, lessons learned. Um, the first experience, I was uh, teaching a class of 12-year-olds, modern dance, and it was the second floor of an old building in the ballroom. The only means of egress was where the guy showed up, and he was a known person with difficulties. And I, here I had a class of these young 12-year-olds, and there was no, nothing to do, so I had them actually continue their dance, and I went over to uh, the fire escape door and said, okay, everybody down the fire escape. And we all got out. It was, a, it was before cell phones, so we had to commandeer a parent to get the police to get the guy out of there. But lessons learned, you need help assessing. If you're there at night, it doesn't even matter if it's at night, but uh, to assess your security uh, issues. Also, um, you need to know the state law. And this happened in Beaufort, South Carolina, where I was running an arts council and the Performing Arts Center on a campus. And this gentleman, I call, loosely call him a gentleman, came, would come in and he would appear after my, when I was alone in the office. And there was no egress in the office as well. And, uh, well, long story short, they had just put in the South Carolina stalker law, and my um, assistant's husband was an NCIS uh, agent, and he's like, this is serious. We're calling in the sheriff. And what the, we had to fulfill the, the criteria of the state law, which meant that the dean of the campus, who was in charge of the campus, had to be the one to tell the guy he was not allowed on campus before the police could arrest him. So there became this great operation to see when the guy was there. And it turns out he was wanted for murder in Texas. So um, you really need to know what you're doing when it comes to stalkers and, uh, you know, the safety. Okay, another giant uh, 1972 flood hurricane. Agnes and Corning. I'm working with the uh, 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 the Southern Finger, Finger Lakes. We we have our creative placekeeping network, mainly due to this experience, which this community has really never, never really well. We recovered and 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 such, and and we uh, the Arts Council did this uh, oral history project, and it was 45 years later, and the memories of people were just so incredibly livid, uh, vivid. Uh, it's in, amazing, but it was a, 79 people were killed, uh, loss of, uh, well, the Corning Museum of Glass, which is now on stilts, uh, rebuilt. Um, and it was a wonder, actually a good example of leadership at, at, at the local level, both public and private, uh, as being successful in bringing a community around. But the other experience was also in Beaufort, South Carolina, where the deluge system just became activated on its own overnight and flooded everything. Well, it came down here on the newly laid beautiful stage floor and filled up the pit and everything. And it was before the grand opening of the space. So uh, had to know who the vendors were, insurance policies, all these things where you learn the hard way. Loss of a donor. This is a real emergency when all your printed material has been done and you, uh, you assume that the commitment that these two major, and if I told you who they were, you'd 
probably die. Uh, it, it, <laughs> um, anyway, I realized um, I had to find new donors and new sources of funding, and I wouldn't have anything uh, in print. So there was the added expense of how do you recognize these new donors, how do you get them, and also uh, what kind of crisis communication plan. You have to start talking to your donors, your, your audience, your musicians. If you can't keep it you know, you can't keep it a secret. You have to communicate, and a message has to be specific for each group, each stakeholder group. And uh, having a reserve fund is very important. And here we have the ducks. This was my first day as interim president and CEO of the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra. It had been raining for most of the month, and little did I know, there were ducks swimming in a rather large, deep pool of water that was about to injure the roof. And I had this fireman running up, lady, lady, you've got ducks on your roof. And I'm like, OK, <laughs> what do I do about that? Um, and as I said before, the, the library of the, of the Rochester Philharmonic, which was pretty extensive, 100 years since George Eastman was a donor. Um, it was right underneath. We were able to get that out. But what I learned is, as uh, the admin space we rented, this building, we were responsible for all capital upkeep and improvements. That was in the lease that I was able to find. Amazing. Uh, however, I had to find a new donor for the $50,000 uh, unexpected expense. So know what your lease is and know what you're responsible for. Regional Snow, and uh, we didn't have a, uh, a ticket refund policy. My, my orchestra was under $500,000 budget and there was per, paid per service, all these or, uh, members from all over upstate New York. And uh, they got, so I owed them for four rehearsals. And if I canceled the performance, I was going to lose, would have to refund the uh, cost of the tickets. And that was a $50,000 potential liability. Fortunately, it was late March, and the snow melted quickly. And we were all be able to have the performance. But another reason for reserved funds and a communications plan, you know, the phone tree, uh, how do you get a hold of everybody? And of course, the Performing Arts Center was, was happy not to have the performance because they didn't want to come out and work in the snow. So you got you to be organized. Um, this actually <laughs> happened to me. Um, that was a door in the other side of the building. Um, a car went out of control, an older gentleman. Um, it went entirely into the office, and his foot was on the, on the accelerator so that it quickly filled up with smoke and the tires spinning, so the exhaust, etc. cetera. The, uh, back, the, the bad thing is that we, we were just before performance. I didn't have a backup for any of my financials or my donor information, and I had no idea where we, we were kicked out of the space. I did a little cat and mouse game with the codes officer, who still remembered me when I moved back <laughs> two years ago, um, he, uh, to try to get my laptop out of there and get information. So uh, not only back up your files, but make sure you have a backup location where you can work. And also make sure you have access to the same software. Um, you know, somebody can let you have use of a, of a uh, laptop or even a, a regular PC. But if it doesn't have your e-tapestry or whatever, you're in trouble. OK, this is the bomb threat. Um, interesting. Uh, it was the first 
Performing Arts Center, brand new, and it was the first performing arts center that uh, produced uh, angels in America. So they were used to getting some bomb threats. This was a magician, whom you will, initials are DC. Anyway, uh, we get the, she got the bomb threat, and what are we gonna do? It's in the middle of the performance. And he actually had the idea, since nobody had been trained for evacuation, they didn't wanna create the panic, um, he said, I will go out on stage and I will tell everyone that my next act is going to be performed in the plaza and that everyone needed to leave in an orderly fashion and meet up at the plaza. Meanwhile, the police came in with the dog sniffing for bombs and it was a false alarm. However, it was just you know, the, the brilliance of the people who were there and, and a lot of luck. And I suggest to you all, don't leave it to luck. And this is my clogged flu. I, I was exhausted, didn't know why. And I, my office on the second floor, all the exhaust of the furnace. And I was away and I was actually feeling better when I get the phone call that one of my um, asthmatic staff people had passed out driving home, taken to the hospital, and she had carbon monoxide poisoning. So uh, the architect owner of our space had assured me that everything was up to code. It was not. And so even if somebody tells you that, make sure you do a hazard workplace condition up, update with, on, on a regular basis. That's all I can say is we were lucky. So preparedness makes good sense and makes way for prompt resumption of service. It expedites response and recovery. Saves time, trouble, and expense in the long run. It does if you mitigate beforehand and it min minimizes damage and replaces chaos with thoughtful response and recovery. So, start now. Why do readiness planning? And there are many reasons that hopefully I've just pointed out, but protecting community and cultural assets, demonstrating sus sustainability to investors, and uh, it can show, it can help you with your insurance company as well. And also just the ability to get up and going after a sh uh, an incident. And out there we have a, a postcard about Arts Ready 2.0. It is uh, an online emergency preparedness service that will be for everyone. It's similar to, those of you in the audience know D-Plan. Well, we're, we're actually, the museum side and cultural side will come through D-Plan, and the performing arts side will come through Arts Ready, and it will be an online service, and we are hoping this will be ready to go for beta testing by the end of this month. So, please, do as I say, not as I have done. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. That would be Ben Rose um, from Vermont Emergency Management. And as he makes his way up to the lectern, I just want to thank him profusely. The fact that he has been so, oh, my thumb. <laughs> we could have mitigated that a little better. Anyway. The fact that, that Ben's been, he's just trying to distract me so I don't compliment him. The fact that he has been involved with our process and has shown the commitment of the emergency management side of state government from the beginning has been tremendously important and it's just going to be fabulous to be working with him throughout this entire process because he's also going to be on our steering committee. Um, we also uh, have had the advantage of having Doug Babcock, who you'll hear from later, um, who's a public safety officer and is the president? 
of the Vermont um, Emergency Managers Association, a new group. So they're committed to working with us as well. Because as Meg alluded to, there's a real importance to having cultural heritage organizations work in conjunction with emergency management and make sure that they know more about us and we know more about their ICS, EOC, and all the other stuff y'all do. So Ben's gonna talk a bit now. Um, you also have the opportunity to hear more from him this afternoon, talking about public assistance. But now he's gonna talk about Irene. Thank you, all right, now sit down, be quiet. <laughs> um, and uh, also, I know there are about 60 of us, am I too loud? All right, I know there are about 60 of us in the room. Um, show of hands if you work for a state agency. One, two, three, four, five, six, okay. Show of hands if you um, um, are an emergency manager. Doug, anybody else? Are there any local emergency management directors? EMDs here, no, well, Doug. Okay, and show of hands if you work for an organization, a nonprofit, or some other organization, and you are sort of entrepreneurial, and you're here looking for how is this going to help me and my organization? And, and how many of you actually worry about funding and where money comes from if something really bad happens? <laughs> okay. Well, so uh, my session this afternoon at 2 o'clock is going to be down in the weeds of the alphabet soup and where the federal money comes from and where it doesn't come from. So um, I, w I really want to try to be helpful to you. and I. I, I spent a good chunk of my career in the nonprofit sector, and I feel your angst. Um, in this phase of my career, um, I find myself as an emergency management bureaucrat. Um, so I guess I wear a bright tie and try to mitigate the alphabet soup that I'm about to present to you. Um, and by the way, who is listening to VPR on the way here this morning? Anybody? I, Every second word was disaster, resilience, emergency. I mean, between the Bahamas and uh, Dorian and the global situation, um, the, the language that we use of disaster, resiliency, emergency, resilience, is it's in danger of becoming the new resilient, uh, the new sustainability. I mean, the words start to blur together. And, I, later on, I'm going to try to engage you a little bit in thinking about the language that we use. We need the artistic community. We need help with our words, I think. Um, <clears throat> all right, we know what happened eight years ago on August 28, 2011. 11 inches of rain fell on the summit of Menden Mountain. Um, this tropical storm came right up through Vermont. Um, I live in Williston Village, and that's in the green. So we just thought it was a rainy day in Chittenden County. Um, and the next morning, much of Vermont was destroyed. And the numbers were big. I was, um, I was not involved in emergency management at all until February 2nd, 2012, four plus months after Irene. And Sue Minter, who was then the Irene recovery officer, asked me if I would help with the Irene recovery. And a few days later, I walked into the FEMA Joint Field Office, or JFO, in Essex Junction, and there were a couple of hundred federal people there writing project worksheets for Vermont communities that had had their infrastructure destroyed, and there were no state people there. And we were getting run over in ways that we really didn't understand at the time. And Region 1 of FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, had never dealt with anything like Irene before. So this was two orders of magnitude bigger than what either the state or the feds were used to dealing with. And we were all drinking out of a fire hose. And within a couple of weeks, um, dozens and dozens of community officials had me on speed dial. And I ran around the JFO for 18 months with my hair on fire. And at the end of that, two years, the state had filed over 30 appeals on behalf of Vermont communities. We had won more than half of them. Uh, we had learned a lot. We had become a much more muscular uh, emergency management agency, and we had come to understand all the cycles of emergency management. Um, so this is some of the money that, that flowed through various Vermont state agencies. Um, 
you'll notice that the local impact, the local, on local property taxes, was only in the order of $10 million. Um, $30 million was just money lost. My, my dad had a small building in Brandon that he rented out, and it flooded, and it never really occurred to him to ask anybody for help beyond his insurance settlement. There are lots of those stories out there. Lots of neighbors help neighbors. Private insurance, we think, covered about $60 million. But look at the federal number, $600 million. That's between federal highway for the major roads and FEMA public assistance for the local road infrastructure um, and the state office building. With over 1,000 state workers were displaced. Yeah, this is a breakdown of the federal dollars. So I guess one thing I want to say is that when you drive through Vermont now, eight years later, unless you're looking for it, you don't really see the scars of Irene. Um, the state is mostly put back together now. Um, it's a, it is a great country in that the, the Stafford Act, named for a Vermont senator, allows communities to recover from something like that with federal assistance when they need it. Um, so this is a messy diagram of how FEMA emergency management um, planners conceive of emergency, the emergency management disaster response cycle. And there's this short-term thing. There's a disaster. Boom. But here's a disaster. And the people we think of as emergency managers and are, are the first responders, firemen, policemen, um, uh, EMTs. Um, and they're adrenaline junkies. They're sprinters. And then there are these waves, and here it is eight years later, and we're still doing the paperwork to close out the last projects from Tropical Storm Irene. And what we discovered is that whereas response is a sprint, recovery is an ultramarathon most of the time. And there are actually four phases of emergency management. It's a circle and it's continuous. There's preparedness. It's what you do in advance, which is what we're doing right here today. There's what the first responders do, and then there's the recovery, which goes on in cycles and waves forever, and then there's mitigation. And actually, I want to spend most of the time on mitigation, and we'll, get, we'll come back to that, and that's where the vocabulary comes into effect. So just a couple of data points on Irene. I don't know if you can see the numbers, but what I want to call your attention to is that Bethel had over $5 million of damage. Jamaica, with a half million dollar road damage, had almost five million dollars of damage. Um, these are basically the top ten towns in terms of the big hits. And most of the infrastructure that got destroyed was transportation infrastructure. Why? Because our roads and our villages are built where the water was. <clears throat> so when the rivers decided to move, the towns were in the way. <clears throat> What I'm supposed to talk about is um, the lessons learned from Irene and what has changed. So I, these next few slides are, are going to be very text heavy, but I'm going to try to focus on the things that I think are relevant to you all. Um, we learned some things that are mostly inside baseball for state bureaucrats, like the fact that our, our fluvial erosion hazard mapping is needed to be improved and that FEMA focuses on inundation flooding, like what happens on the Mississippi River, whereas what we have is fluvial erosion, where a flashy mountain stream decides to move, and, um, and so it's sideways violent action, and it's hard to map, and it's hard to explain to FEMA that a house that just got wiped downstream and is gone now should be eligible for a buyout. And FEMA would say, this really happened. FEMA will say, well, those five houses that got wiped away in the town of Jamaica, they weren't in the special flood hazard area. We say, what do you mean they weren't in the special flood hazard area? They're down the river. They're gone. They got, just got wiped out. And FEMA says, well, we have to go by the maps. And it's, it's not mapped as special flood hazard area. And we say, well, the map is wrong. Reality just really happened. And fluvial erosion is harder to map. And what Vermont river engineers, who are really on the cutting edge nationally, have been trying to say is the, the water course has a meander belt, and anything that's in that meander belt is ultimately in harm's way. Um, 
the rivers and streams haven't done anything wrong. We've just built in their way, and we're fighting that. And the more we channelize those rivers and streams, the more hazard there is. So anyway, that, I don't want to get into fluvial morphology, but uh, I just did. Um, we, know, we learned that we need to strengthen interagency communication and coordination. One of the good things that came out of Irene for the state of Vermont is it just totally busted silos in state government. The Agency of Natural Resources, the Agency of Transportation, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, Vermont Emergency Management, and the Department of Public Safety. We talk to each other a lot now, a lot more, and we, we coordinate so much better. Um, we know that there's a great train, an ongoing training need um, we know that we needed to update our, some standards and policies. I, I don't want to get into all that today. Uh, we've applied some lessons learned. And again, I'm not going to talk about these, these top ones. We, we're doing that. We've done that. Uh, we'll talk, if we have time, about planning. But I actually want to talk to you a little bit about this one and the fifth one in particular. Um, the Vermont Economic Resiliency Initiative uh, was a, a project done by the Agency of Commerce and Community Development uh, to really look at specific communities. And they drilled down and looked at, um, oh, and then we'll also look at this one. Um, so VERI, if you will, V-E-R-I, looked at specific communities and targeted five, uh, the three Bs, Brattleboro, Brandon, and, um, no, sorry, was I drifting from the mic? Yeah. That, that, now I get it, sorry. Brandon, uh, Barry, and um, Brattleboro are the three Bs, and then Enosburg and Woodstock were the five that they focused in on um, to say what can we do to uh, make these communities more resilient. And specific actions have been taken, especially in the three Bs. Um, we need to do that level of planning work in all of our communities. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Brattleboro Project in particular. And then this, the, the fifth of those things, um, this one, um, this Flood Ready website is something that we did with federal funds. It's a really cool website. There are tremendous resources there. And you can actually look at your community specifically and find out, do we have a hazard mitigation plan? Do we have an emergency operations plan? Are our transportation codes and standards up to date? Um, who here from an, from an organization knows who your local emergency management director is? Good. Does anybody not? You don't have to raise your hand. But if you don't, that's a really good thing to know, because all disaster response starts local. I mean, the, the state only gets called when something escalates. And uh, by the way, something I meant to mention is that my pager could go off at any time. And that's because um, this week I'm the state watch officer. There are six of us in the, in the rotation. And uh, this week I'm on 24-7 call. And if this pager goes off, that's essentially a first responder somewhere in the state calling 911 to the state just as you, as individuals call 911 if they have a need for help. If first responders have a need for state resources, they call an 800 number, the pager goes off, and the state watch officer is then responsible for deploying whatever state resources we can bring to bear. Um, so hopefully the pager won't go off for the next few minutes. Um, that's, that's the response piece, but um, resources for the long-term recovery are on this flood ready website. It's pretty cool. Oh, this was January. I was the watch officer on a really bad day, January 24th, and um, Flower, Brook, and Pollitt decided to be somewhere else because of an ice jam, and the fire chief's house <laughs> got flooded. Um, okay, this is what I really wanted to get to. Um, mitigation is one of those words. Uh huh, mitigation. So um, I want to talk to you about what can be done. Granted that Vermont communities were built where the hydropower was, typically right next to streams. We have whole beautiful, charming, quaint little downtowns full of cultural and, and historic resources that are eight feet below base flood elevation. I mean, they are built where the stream was or is and will be again. 
Um, so we could pour an infinite number of dollars into mitigating flood hazard and we'll never spend our way out of being flood vulnerable in Vermont. And uh, it's important to recognize that nobody, including a, a government official, can completely mitigate or offset the risk of natural disaster. Um, but the federal government has, in fact, had a pretty good recognition that if you're going to invest in helping people recover from disasters, it's a good investment of public dollars to spend some dollars reducing the long-term vulnerability um, and mitigating future risks. So the way the Stafford Act works is that for every dollar of public assistance, for every one of those $210 million of public assistance that the federal government contributed to rebuilding infrastructure in 225 towns after Irene, for every one of those dollars, 15 cents was provided to the state of Vermont to make hazard mitigation grants to any community anywhere in the state or to a qualifying nonprofit in the state to do an eligible hazard mitigation project. So for Irene, that was $34.5 million. And the state used over $20 million of that to do home buyouts. Mostly, it served double duty as a humanitarian mission because we had hundreds of people who'd lost everything and we were able to buy out about 150 homes and let people essentially restart their lives. I mean, years after Irene, there were still people couch surfing because of Irene. Um, but we, we were able to uh, mitigate a lot of personal suffering by doing buyouts of homes that just should not have been rebuilt in those places. Um, the first thing to say about this hazard mitigation funding is that um, to be eligible, the community has to have a FEMA-approved hazard mitigation plan. So this is a map. Green is good. It means those communities have approved uh, hazard mitigation plans. And uh, there are a few like, um, I don't know, I don't worry too much about Somerset and Glastonbury because basically nobody lives there. So you know, most of the population of the, of the state is covered by a hazard mitigation plan. Um, there are a few that are just against planning, you know. Um, but this, the, less than 40% of Vermont communities had hazard mitigation plans at the time of Irene. And so we've been trying to chip away to, uh, the, the number of plan, towns that actually have plans either approved or in draft is over 70% now. So um, anyway, that's one thing. So what is the hazard, what do we do with hazard mitigation? Well, the, the best thing we can do is to take something that has been damaged or is repetitively damaged or is in imminent danger of being damaged um, by flooding, which is our number one hazard, um, and demo it and get rid of it. And the land is then owned by the town or a nonprofit uh, as open space in perpetuity and essentially we give it back to the river. And it's a happy river. That's a good thing. Um, Another, other things that we can do with hazard mitigation funding are we can upsize culverts so the river has a place to go. And there are, there are co-benefits. Uh, the trout have a place to go. The debris has a place to go. Um, so better drainage structures is a great investment for communities. Uh, we can invest in generators for critical facilities. We're fighting with FEMA to provide a generator for the emergency operations center in the town of Brownington. It's a long way from anywhere in Brownington, and in, on a really, really cold snap, without power, it could be it could be a life safety issue if the emergency operations center doesn't have a generator. So, um, we can do elevations. Now, that's interesting because, let's say you've got a beautiful historic building in a beautiful historic downtown. We're not going to move the downtown. Um, we don't want to just disappear the building. Um, FEMA will pay to elevate the thing. And you've seen pictures of beach houses elevated up on stilts to come, you know, get out of the rising tide. Um, the problem is the aesthetics of that. And in our experience, elevations tend to cause heartbreak because FEMA is very finicky about what they approve because they really don't love elevation projects. Um, well, I, I, well, sorry, I don't want to get sidetracked on elevation projects. The bottom line is that when you elevate a structure that's in floodplain, you're not really mitigating flood hazard. You're just moving it downstream and reinforcing the thing that's in the river's way. And FEMA won't pay for you to bring in more fill to landscape up to the new level. So the thing just looks, ugh, it's up there. 
better to just buy it out, all right, or else to just move everything out of the basement and have an unfinished basement. Or, um, we can do really cool visionary things like we're doing in Brattleboro. Um, downtown Brattleboro is right in the crosshairs of the Whetstone Brook. And we're doing a series of multi-million dollar projects competing for federal funds based on having a really good benefit cost ratio for the projects we're doing to pull out old historic fill, um, get rid of an old lumber yard um, that's basically raising the flood elevations in Brattleboro. Uh, this is, this is a project, oh, that's a project that's being done through multiple phases. Um, it started with um, demolishing Melrose Terrace that got d really destroyed by Irene. This is where a lot of very vulnerable people in Brattleboro live. And um, so it, it's a big, ambitious, multi-phase mitigation project. Um, and by the way, we had our, our state emergency management pre or preparedness conference this Friday and Saturday at Lake Maury. And um, Rachel was there. and. Um, Ann Lawless from the American Precision Museum and um, John Potter from the Latches in Brattleboro were there, and a picture is worth a thousand words. That was, it was, that really put a fine point on me how how it connects. So here's a here's a cool project. This is the Burnham Library in Lincoln, and what they did is they uh, built. This is called dry flood proofing. They basically have these these shutters that keep the flood water from getting in. That was a FEMA-funded mitigation project. That's if you're in the flood zone and you don't want to flood, there are things you can do. Um, and these are the people who, who are part of my team who you talk to if you're interested in a community hazard mitigation project. Um, so in closing, um, what did we learn and what has changed in Vermont from Irene? Well, so now we're focused much more not just on preparedness and response, but also on recovery and mitigation. Um, we um, we um, have, I think, learned a lot of lessons from Irene about the need for ongoing communication. We're fortunate in that we've had 10 smaller disasters federally declared since Irene. Uh, lots of floods, a few ice storms. And they keep the state and the communities up to date as, as the FEMA programs constantly change. Um, whatever comes next, the next big one, won't be Irene, it'll be something different. And what it really comes down to is that Vermont did pretty well by the national metric in, in our response to Irene. Eight years later, it's just about wrapped up. And when you talk to FEMA people about that, they say, well, Vermont has tight communities. And it, so resilience is a hard thing to quantify it, but you know it when you see it. Part of it is that in, in a community, often the people who think about long-term land use planning um, and submitting plans are different people from the first responders. And emergency management was always the purview of the people in the firehouse. And the people who are really thinking about the future of the community are volunteers who show up on Tuesday night to work on plans. And um, the people who really tell the story and hold the conscience of the community may be people in your organizations. You're the storytellers. And you have a lot of power and a lot of importance in how communities learn from disasters and adapt for the future based on what they've learned. So um, it's a little all over the place, I know. But um, I just want to say that I think that that you in this room have a lot of, a lot to offer to emergency management. And if I can go on for one more paragraph, I think we're okay. Um, I, I wanted to go back to that word mitigation. So obviously climate change is part of this. We're, we're seeing more precipitation, we're seeing more violent precipitation, we're seeing less predictability, we're having to think about things like drought and invasives, there are creeping hazards, there are, it, it, it's a very complicated world and, um, uh, you know, as Janet would say, based on her experience, oy vey. I just, there's a lot, but when you're thinking about climate, you, you think, we think about climate mitigation and climate adaptation. Climate mitigation is let's put less carbon in the air so that we'll slow down climate change. We're mitigating the effects of humanity on the climate. 
When we think about climate adaptation, that's okay, the climate is changing. How do we adapt for a, a more flooding future? So when, on the emergency management side, when we talk about mitigation, we're talking about climate adaptation. The word mitigation is being used in different ways by the climate people and the emergency managers. Um, so the word mitigation is from, from the emergency management side means, okay, there's a lot more flooding coming. How do we get out of its way so that we can coexist with the future climate? Um, it's not to say we shouldn't also be mitigating the impact of how much worse the climate is getting and how fast. Um, that's a lot. Um, thank you for your time and attention. And I hope that if you're really worried about um, funding and uh, specific tactics that will be helpful to your organization, uh, catch me or come this afternoon, and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you.